Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am honored to welcome our guests. Tonight, we come together to learn the story of a remarkable man. Veteran United States Secret Service Officer Leth Oon has protected presidents and vice presidents in four administrations in almost every state and more than a dozen countries. His new book, A Refugee's American Dream, written with award-winning novelist, poet, journalist, and essayist, Joe Samuel Starnes, recounts Un's father's execution by the brutal Khmer Rouge, his almost four years of enslavement in the killing fields, followed by more than three years in refugee camps, his eventual arrival in the U.S. as a penniless 17-year-old, and his incredible journey to the Secret Service by way of Philadelphia, that culminates with Un's return to Cambodia as part of President Obama's protection detail. Please join me in welcoming Leth Un and Joe Samuel Starnes to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Okay, well thank you everyone for coming out uh, tonight. I mean, this is really fantastic uh, to, to be up here on this stage. I've been coming to book events here for since I moved to the Philadelphia area in 2006. So I've seen so many great writers up here, I can't list them all. And I wouldn't be up here now if it wasn't uh, first and foremost for Lethoon, uh, but I'd also like to thank Sean Viggle from Temple University Press for picking out our book and Gary Kramer for helping to arrange this event. So uh, I feel like this, this uh, auditorium is sort of like the Carnegie Hall of literary events. So it's, uh, it's great to be up here. Um, thanks to everyone for coming out. Lots of good friends I, I see in the audience. Thank you. I was going to give Leth a chance to thank everyone, and then we're going to just jump right in. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here, and thank you for having me on the stage. It is uh, the great opportunity for me to tell my cyber story, and just want to give the credit where the credit's due. Sam's do a lot of work for it. He put a lot of time into it. I started this book like almost 10 years ago, but due to the job, on the road, travel around the world, misplaced something, it, it took almost like seven years to get it done. He put a lot of times, a lot of times, so I just want to give credit where the credit's due. Temple teams, thank you a lot. Thank you so much. Without you guys, the book probably is floating in the air somewhere, probably 10 years from now, maybe you'll never get it done. I just want to thank you, everybody, helped me out to make this book what it is today. Cheryl, you too, so. Um. Yeah, well, thank you, Leth. You know, it's funny how I met Leth. Uh, it was a sleepy summer day in July of 2011, and I was a alum the uh, editor of Widener University's alumni magazine. And I got a knock on the door, and a sociology professor there at the time, Vernon Smith, showed up and said, hey, here's somebody you should write a profile of, just out of the blue. And I said, well, sure, sit down, and uh, we talked. And I interviewed Leth for about an hour and a half, and you just, you know, I was going, it was sort of a lazy afternoon where I didn't plan to do that much work. And uh, it turns out this story comes along and just falls in my lap. And I did the interview, wrote the story. We got great photographs of Leth and his daughter, Jenny, who was a student at Widener at the time. And wrote the magazine article, maybe eight or 800, 800 to 1,000 words. And I was never happy with it. I mean, I felt like, how can you take this man's life and squeeze it into four magazine pages? And I just didn't feel like I did a great job. Fortunately, we had great photographs in the magazine. But uh, Leth, fortunately, Leth loved the story. I uh, really appreciated it, stayed in touch, got extra copies. So after the article ran, he would text me. He would come to speak to classes at Widener, and we'd go to lunch, and we stayed in touch over the years. And actually, that very first time he met me, he told me, he said, you know, I want to write a book about my life. And I said, well, you, you certainly should, uh, not knowing that one day I would be helping with it. But after we got to know each other, he said, hey, could you help me with my book? And I was working on a, a novel, and my daughter was young. I just had a million things going on. I didn't know a whole lot about Cambodia. You know, I'd seen the movie The Killing Fields and read newspaper articles, but by no means did I feel qualified to write a book about it. But if you know Leth and you read the book, he's a persistent man. So <laughs> he stayed after me, and then he wrote 50,000 words on his own. Uh, and imagine not learning a word of uh, Khmer, the Cambodian language, and writing your life story in that language. So that's so, sort of what he had done. Uh, he'd worked with actually Dr. Barbara Ryan, who is not here tonight, but she's a Philadelphia resident, also a former Widener professor, who uh, worked with him on a first chapter. In about 2017, uh, 
actually our first president, there was a lot of anti-immigration uh, rhetoric going on. And I thought, well, here's a man who is a political refugee who's protecting presidents. You know, he's protected four presidents now. I thought, you know, I want to get back in touch with Leth and work on this book. And we did. So that was, you know, it's been almost six years ago that we sat yeah. down and we did. Inter- Leth wrote about 50,000 words and through interviews and rewriting and lots of work, uh, we you know, ended up almost 110,000 words and finished the book, and we were thrilled that Temple University Press uh, published it. So uh, I'm real happy with the story of how this all came together and that we're able to sit here with this book book now. So I want to jump in uh, and have Leth you know, read a few sections, and we're going to talk through uh, mostly parts of the prologue uh, of the book. So it, the prologue starts when Leth, uh, in 2012, when Leth was working protection, and he was handling his uh, uh, bomb-sniffing dog, Reich, and he was on the plane flying to Cambodia in advance of President Obama, who was the first president ever to visit Cambodia. And that, he had, Leth had not been back to Cambodia in 32 years at that time. This was 2012. And it brings up a lot of memories of what he had gone through in Cambodia in the killing field. So, Leth, if you don't mind reading that first paragraph. Yeah, sure. I've got to put my glasses on. Too. <laughs> so, I could recognize my pa from a way simply by watching him take a single step. He stood about five feet tall, five feet seven inches tall, and hot, short, thick black hair. He walked with his, his fists clenched and his elbows bent sharply as he brought his powerful arm up in time. His drives were rigid and purposeful, a gait he had learned when he was a soldier in his teens. He held his back rammed straight and his shoulders high and kept his head very still, his dark eyes looking ahead. He had been in the army for so long that he marched everywhere. Even when he's not wearing his green officer's uniform, he marched. He marched when he relaxed. That's what a lifetime of war does to a man. So the story of my father, uh, he decided to join the military before the Khmer Rouge happened. So I don't know how much you guys know about military back there. We grew up poor family, make very minimum salary, almost nothing, but he loved the country. He put the life forward, fought the country, and that's one thing every day, Memorial Day, I don't know where he's at, where the body, where the man's at. I wish I could just uh, go there and say, hey, thank you, Dad, for your service, protecting. I, I have no idea where that. So my whole family, before we start that, my whole family is the military. Army, uh, we call them Marine Commandos, so that's what I grew up with. And your father, um, it was he joined the Cambodian military actually under the during World War II yes. when the uh, the Nazis were in control of uh, Cambodia and then the Japanese for a while but after the French came back in control after the war yeah. he became a paratrooper paratrooper and t- yeah. t- tell the story about how he first jumped from the plane he he always just brought that story in come back one day he come back home with a whole bunch of bandages on him <laughs> so my mom was like what happened to you we're like well they put me into Practicing paratrooper. So there, a French sergeant who's in charge of that exercise, so my dad didn't want to jump up the plane. So he actually, you know, talks by a Frenchman, just get out of there. So the first didn't know how to do it, and you know, come back with late scrapes, grand face, and all that. And my mom's like, should you do it again? He's like, well, I kind of like it. <laughs> so he kept doing it again, and finally he's jumped it like a, 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 the thing he's doing every day. He's got a mail of that. So he did a lot of battlefields, so he jumped a lot of, you know, do a lot of paratroopers in the battlefield. So he loved what he did, and uh, that's what he said, you know, son, you don't have to go join the Army, carry gun, don't, but here, uh, here I am, you know. Yeah, but on, in the very first time, he yeah. decided he didn't want to jump, but they yeah, had didn't. the parach- yeah. parachute on him, and yeah. they threw him out, out of the airplane, right? Yeah, he grew to love it, so <laughs> I never did it. I mean, one day I'm probably going to do it, you know, uh, skydiving me, you know, close enough to me, and uh, we'll see what happens. But so that was the late 40s when late 40, he would yeah. have been in his 20s. And so he saw you know, many battles over yeah. several decades. And he yes. fought uh, in all sorts of battles. A lot of battlefields, yeah. So and in April 1975, he, I mean, he'd been involved in the Civil War against the Khmer Rouge from the late 60s yes. to the 70s. And he talked about in the book how he was gone for you know, weeks and months at a yeah. time. 
uh, in fighting and in battles. But in April 1975, when the Khmer Rouge took over the cities, um, that's something that you were nine years old, right, yeah. and uh, your father was at the army base, but you and your mother and sister were all at, all at home. So if you don't mind reading that section, that next section, sure. when you first, about when you first saw the Khmer Rouge soldiers. So, do you know what the Khmer Rouge is, right? Uh, Rouge means red, so Khmer is a Cambodian, so the Khmer is called Khmer Rouge, and sometimes we call it communist, so that's what it comes from. So anyway, Khmer Rouge soldiers crowded the city streets and took control of our communities, banging on every door in the circle of seven small houses around a common area. It was the first time I saw an ominous uniform that became the Khmer Rouge trademark. Black pajama-like outfits, which red and white checkered scarves, known as Khmer. Khmer is like a, a scarf that long, uh, Cambodian people still use it today, so I don't know why, don't ask me. And sandal made of cut rubber tires. They rode down our street in trucks and jeeps and a few tanks hanging from the sides and hanging from the sides and back, often at ten to a jeep meant to seat four passengers. Most carry AK forty sevens supplied by Chinese. And some fire machine gun burst into the airs. Others carry rocket propelled grenade launchers known as RPG. They swarmed in a park around our houses and houses our neighbors. My mom and my sister, Dee, who's our older sister, and I hovered inside. Our curtain pulled over the windows and door. I had a dog, Dino, a little French bulldog whom I had and petted as we waited. Be very quiet, my mom said. The Khmer Rouge soldiers were young, many of them teenagers and a few as young as 12. We could tell by their postures, postures and the way they would talk and they were very illiterate farm boys. They were thin, their faces grunt, as they had been starved. Their skin was very dark from a long exposure to the sun. All had a look of hatred in their eyes. Some had been fighting in the jungle for years and had endured many battles. We listened as these rebel soldiers shouted at our neighbors. Our homes were close. We could hear everything. They were very rude, screaming at even the elderly, foregoing the traditional respect Cambodians paid to seniors. We were frozen with fear as we heard them climb up our steps. They pulled open the curtain and served as our doors. Five rifle welding soldiers stepped inside looking around crowding our one-room home. My mom had to take down a black and white photo of my bow in which, in his army uniform and hidden in under her clothes. She knew they were looking for anyone who had been in the army or police. We wrapped our arm around my dog, Dino, pulling him against me. Yeah, so thanks for reading that, yeah. Leth. After that, the, I mean, the, the soldiers were looking for anybody who was in the army. They denied that there, I think they said your father was a taxi driver. Yes. And he was off to work. Um, and so then after that, you know, you went, got on your bicycle and went looking for your father. And you rode all around uh, Badambang City, yeah. where you're from. And actually, one thing that, you know, the, this Khmer Rouge had done, they had turned the schools in town basically into prisons where they were taking all the soldiers and police officers there. So tell me a little bit about that story about looking for your father. Um, when the thing happened, they went around like, I just read, they couldn't find it. So I always went by, I was waiting for my dad to show up because, you know, thing is so chaotic. So hopefully being a father, you got to come home, look for a wife and children, but I couldn't. So my mom didn't want me to go outside. So I lied to my mom, so. I said, well, I'm going to go outside a little bit, I'll be back. But I was like on a mission to find my dad. I know where the base at, which is like four or five miles away. Back then, the kilometers, what, I don't know, 10 kilometers. One speed by in the middle of the scorching sun, dusty on the roads. The tanks and all these uh, um, communists with the jeeps right around it. I would just, you know, be on my way, don't pay no mind to them. Yeah. So I went to the base. I couldn't find anyone over there. It was just empty, all the uniforms everywhere. 
And I asked the lady who's walking by there, I said, what happened to all these soldiers? She's like, oh, they picked them up and yeah, they took all them to the school. I said, which school? She's like, I don't know what school. So my next mission is to find where my father was at, which school. So I went from one school to the next school to the next school to the next school. The last school I went to was, uh, the, it calls the last South Hill, which one of the elementary school. That's my dad put me there before I really old enough to go to a regular school. So that was a, almost very last hope. And I went in, his friend saw me, and like, are you looking for your dad? I said, yes, he's over there. So I walked over there. Um, he had no shirt on, uh, green pants with a handkerchief trying to tie his head. I said, you know, he came in, hugged me, we both cried. And I said, don't stay too long. Go back to your mom, tell your mom that uh, I'm okay. So he told me from what I heard that we're gonna go to uh, farms, become a farmers, and then hopefully we come back home. So the next day I went back there, brought the food, breakfast, and lunch. The third day, I went up there, brought them breakfast. We, you know, uh, we call it rice soup. I, most guys know, like liquid rice soup with fried rice, uh, and f uh, fried fish. At lunch, well, he gave me 500 real, which was less than a penny. Uh, I mean, back then, maybe a penny. I don't know, back then. So at lunch, I brought them lunch, and the plate was gone. So, I mean, my, my heart just dropped. I'm like, okay, now what's next for me? And nobody there, his clothes, uniforms, everything left over there. Got outside, people are like going crazy, chaotic, and people walking sidewalk there. I said, yeah, do you know what happened to the soldiers? And I said, they took him, uh, just pick him up, put him on a personal carrier. He was gone, apparently. We heard the rumor that he's gonna be doing some farm work, farm work. I said, well, you know, it's not too bad. Being a farmer, eventually it's gonna come back, but 40 some years ago, and they would come back. So. Yeah, you were nine years old at this time, yeah. riding your bicycle around yeah. in a city that's basically in a yeah. siege. Um, if you can read that next part there, number three. This, uh, well, you actually, you go back home and you tell your mother, and she cries. Right, she was crying. Cry. My mom's kind of, she knew that what's happened anyway, but she didn't really say anything about it, because, you know, back then, we, who knows what happened, so. I was upset my pa was gone, but working on a farm didn't sound too bad to me. I mean, it was still alive. I thought they would keep him for a while and then would let him come home. But I was wrong. Didn't understand the murderous way of the Khmer Rouge. I didn't know the horror they held in, in store for me, my mother's, my sister. I had seen my pa for the last time. So I was the last person to have seen my dad. Um, you know, that day. So three days after the communists took over, my dad was gone. So, like I said earlier, we are a, a, a military families, and uh, my cousins die, his older brothers, and my grandparents were all commandos back then. Like I say, we, we, we make a little bit of money, but we, we put our lives, they put our lives to protect the country that they're all gone. So, three, four families, I'm the only child or boy in three of the families. So. Well, tell me about your mother who survived the killing fields and, uh, you know, the, the, how that, like, I guess the relationship, has she, I've heard you say that you know, she was like your mother and your father when your after, father was After gone. that, um, when my, my, my dad was taken away and she, she put a, a double role as parents, a mother and a father. She raised all of us. I mean, she put a lot of time, make sure we're all safe and get fed. Um, she would do everything possibly human or mother can have to, to protect us. Um, her and I, we, we came to uh, uh, borders, Thailand, Cambodia, so many trips. And she would, you know, give her food to me just to make sure I have something to eat, all my stuff for that matters. So my mother is the greatest person or woman that I respect in, in the world. Without her, I don't think I'd be who I am today. I know she uh, passed away. I still miss her every day. Um, I'm sure she's watching on me and she's proud of me, smiling on me. You know, I, I, I know she, she's a great woman. Uh, that's all I can say. So she, yeah. she take a double duties, a mother and a father. So that, that's another thing, you know. I came here as Americans, instead of me making myself happy, I want to see my mom happy. That's why we moved to Philadelphia, where a lot of Cambodian communities, she can commute, communicate in a language. I, you know, at that point, my life doesn't matter. 
So she is more important than me. Number one, number two, she's older, she went through a lot, who knows what's gonna happen to her, I mean. So she got a long life, so I have to say that though. Yeah, well, if you don't mind, read the dedication to the book. The book is dedicated to my mother, Sinchum. My father, once, uh, who loves me and willing to do everything for me. I miss them daily. But they are with me always in my heart. I know that every day they're still looking after me. So, and, and, and every day, I, I think I can see them smile at me even I go to work every day. You know, even go to work overseas, you know, during the traveling, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, for that matter. So I always looked up before I take off. So mom, dad, you know, I'm going somewhere, so watch your back. Yeah, I mean, it seems like this book is really, you know, real primary theme of it is the love that the, your parents had for you and your mother's care for you, and then when your care for them, and especially your care for your mother. Yeah. So this book, um, after the scenes we just read, uh, the soldiers forced Leth and his mother and sister into the killing fields where they lived all, you know, what, three years? Uh, three, eight, eight months. months. Don't quote it, roughly about 10 days. So. <laughs> It'll be more or less a little bit of that. So. Yeah. But three years and eight months for sure. And, uh, you know, there's so many painful memories that, that you, you had to go back through that if you read the book, you'll see. Really some just things that, that blew my mind as I worked on the book and, you know, researched things that happened in Cambodia during the killing fields. Um, but it was really hard for you, I know, especially in the beginning when we would sit down to talk about, well, tell me about, you know, this detail or tell me about that. And, you know, it, it was hard on me, but I can't imagine what it was like for you. So why would, why would you, someone want to go back through these memories? Why did you want to write this book? Well, uh, number one, uh, put it out there, the, the, the history that happens, you know, this thing could happen to any country, really. I mean, hopefully not America. Dedicate this book, educated people, um, you know, what had happened in the past still happened in prisons, depending on how you look at it. And number two is the, the prophets will go to help the, the kids, Cambodian kids, maybe here too, not just Cambodians. Because growing poor, you read the book, you find out, um, I don't have flip flops to wear. Mostly, you know, be a feet all the time, we play. You know, I always tell the story when I'm watching soccer with people with shin guards on. I say, what are they put on over there? Like, they look at me like crazy. Like, what is there? A shin guard. like, we don't have shin guards. We just play. You miss the ball, you kick each other. That's how the game's played. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, one of those is hockey's, and you cut a bamboo, like field hockey. You miss the hockey, you hit somebody over. That's the game to play. So, so anyway, back to like, I understand how being poor and going back to see these kids that they want to go to school. They can't afford it because prior, priority for life over there is how do I survive? Basic survival thing is do I need to go to school or die? So which one, we all know. I mean, you're not going to go. I'd rather not read anything, but at least I'm survive. So that's what I dedicate to that and you know, experience. You know, educated people hopefully will you know, motivate, inspire some people, some kids or some way around the world. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully more people inspire from it, and the book motivates that, but it depends who's gonna take the story seriously or, you know. It's just a story, I, it's not just a makeup, it's not science fiction. This is a fact, it's a memoir. I live through that to tell your story, so. Well, I think it's you know important to educate um, people about what happened in Cambodia, which is less than 50 years ago. It wasn't yeah. that really that long ago. And 40, 45, I think, 45, 46 years. Yeah, the 50th anniversary of the Khmer Rouge coming yeah. in will be yeah. in uh, two years from now. Okay. So, uh, but you know the the statistic that blows my mind is that you know Cambodia's population was about eight million in 1975. Four years later, in 1979, it was six million. So approximately two million people died, were either executed, uh, starved to death, died of disease, and uh, that's just a stunning, you know, stunning, uh, stunning figure. Um, and you know what I, I read about how many the Americans, you know, young Americans and older Americans, but, but I think maybe younger, don't know much about you know uh, Nazi Germany. 
I think there'd probably be far fewer that would know about the story in Cambodia. So I think it's like a great you know, thing you can do to educate people about what happened. But also, like, yeah, your point about inspiring others and you know working with uh, you know any money that either left. Or, yeah, I'm not making a penny off this book, and neither is left. Anything that we do. Uh, we're going to give, you know, to some of the... Pro Leth was in Cambodia just recently and right. visited a school that he attended, actually the school where his father was. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Well, um, my school was the next door. It's, it's a boys' school back then, but it's Machem Salas Elementary School, but they tear down, they renovate the different ones. But Salher, which is the school next door, that's where they held my father. So I walked in there. I looked to where he was held at, it seems like everything, I could see him just sitting there and smile at me the first day we met. And the school not much changing at all. And I couldn't take him, I just kept walking. So I went to uh, that class, I said, you know, not to interrupt you and truly being rude or anything. I said, back in 75, this is my father, this is the room where my father was at before they took him away. So they people just stop and look at me. So I have to tell them a little story about it. And I told him, you know, I'm from whatever, I said, uh, Books just came out officially on February 10. So what I'm trying to see in my school, it's gone now. So I want to do something to this school. This is where my father was at, or held at, to, you know, oops, sorry. Um, at least the bathroom, renovate from there first. So, you know, it's so poor. Uh, I'm not saying we all, like, live in a real lifestyle, but most of us will not go to the bathroom anyway, but the kids were going there, so that's what caught my eye because I had to use bathroom there. I saw what happened. So I told the principal, I said, this way I'm gonna start first, renovate the bathroom, the second one library, so education, you know, put some maybe computers, some books, uh, get some tutors, teach them English, so get some kind of after school program, something like that. So it depends how far we can go with the, uh, the books and uh, the uh, the, un the nonprofit organization account goes. So that's how it, you know what's going to be. So let's see how far it's going to go. Um, one thing I know, and a lot of you you traveled actually back a couple of times with some of your coworkers yeah. in Cambodia, and a lot of they're learning more about. It. There are many people that uh, worked with you and probably knew you who had no idea right. what you had gone through for years. So there's actually this fifth part here. I want you to read. Uh, this is going through your mind when you're on the plane flying back to Cambodia and uh, sort of the difficulties of just trying to explain the things that you've endured. Well, all those I didn't discuss my past with my coworkers, I have tried to tell some of my American friends and my American-born children about I went through in the killing fields. But it feels impossible to convey the agony through which we live, the fear and hungers and the pain and ter terror. I didn't have a stable home for eight years, from the age of nine until I was 17. When we were on the run in the jungle, great place to be, trust me. I sometimes slept standing up because of monsoon flooding. I was always hungry and resorted for hunting and eating rat to survive. Much at risk of being shot and killed for doing so. I ate bugs and leaves, almost anything I could find that was digestible, and something that weren't, which made me very sick. I almost starved to death. At my first physical examination after coming to the United States in 1983, I weighed 89 pounds. And that would have been after three or four years <sighs> after of three, four the years refugee, refugee camps. camps. So I was skin to bones, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so you weighed 89 pounds, so 89 you're pounds. about twice that much right now, right? 175, so. <laughs> and, uh, and you can bench press about close to 300 pounds? A good one with 275, so. Okay, okay. So uh, that's pretty good. You've come a long way since that time. Um, you, know, you write in the prologue that you hide your anxiety uh, from your coworkers. You yeah. don't tell everybody, hey, this is what's going on through my mind on the plane back to Cambodia, but you've got a lot of these memories. But there's one traveling with you who knows something's going on with, uh, with Leth. So tell me about your traveling partner and how he knows you and your relationship <coughs> with him. I know you guys have dogs. Most of you guys have dogs. You can't, this is what I tell people all the time. You can lie to the judge, but you can't lie to your dogs. <laughs> you can't stand dogs. They dog knows. I mean, I I grew up with dog all my life. 
you know, when I was Cambodian before the war, I have dog, French bulldog, like I read. Uh, and then I came here, I have German shepherds. And then I have my partners, like it's my partner, my brothers, my family members. His name is Reich, but I tell people it's not the, you know, Reich, you're C-H-K, it's C, you know, with the K. You know. R-E-I-K, right? Yeah, yeah. And he came so with that name from Europe, He right? came with that name. So, you know, it's the story that Reich with C-H, or E. I see H. If I say this is right, I say it's not like that guy. Okay. <laughs> so right, it's uh, my partners. We've been in a lot of countries, dozens of foreign countries. Like I said, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, around the world. Forty-nine states in the United States. So right, look at me when we get off there. It's like uh, you know, he kind of reading me. So he reads not because of sin, because the the, the sense from your pores. That's how dog reads you. So that'd be his $275 tony right now. That's dog training thing. <laughs> so, right, you can't lie to him. So I get off the plane. He was still in the kennel, looked at me, you know. It's like, okay, welcome to you know, your dad's home country. So that's uh, Cambodia. So again, uh, you can't lie to the judges all you want, but you can't lie to the dog. Why do you fake love him? They know, uh, you know, they know. So it, it's, it's amazing. Their brain's like a piece, the size of a pea, but they're smaller than anybody else could imagine. So Rai is a bilingual also, by the way. He understands English and Cambodia. The one and only in the service, and he's lived to be the almost, the lo well, he is the longest living service. He's almost 17 before he died. He died on 9-11, 4.30 4 in the morning. So I have two memories every 9-11. One is the people who died during 9-11s, and one is for my dogs. I'm glad we got Reich on the uh, cover, too. Yeah, he's that's, uh, that's him right there. So, um, and he's a Belgian Malinois. Belgian Malinois. As you guys know about Belgian Malinois? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, more tan than black. And the pure bread of that is 60, 65 pounds. Anything bigger than that, usually it's a mixed bread. It's faster, loves to work, talks a lot, a lot of energy. So I recommend you do not take as a family pet because he will make you have like a trash dumpster. <laughs> you have to walk that dogs a lot. His energy is so phenomenal, it's so high. That's why we picked him. Yeah. So if you don't mind, Leth, the last part I want you to read, this is the last paragraph for the prologue, and this is you've, you've been on the plane and you've had all these memories, and then the plane is starting to touch down. So uh, part six there. Okay, this, the C-17 touches down shortly afternoon in Phnom Penh, which is the capital city. My heart is thumping as take right from his kennel and hatch on the plants opens and we begin to disembark. I'm stepping out under the Cambodian sky for the first time in more than three decades. The sunlight is bright and is hot, as is almost always Cambodia. I look out and see palm trees and skyline of the city. It's dusty and humid and it smells. So I smiled. This is Cambodia. I look around and for a moment I forget what year it is. I don't move, but I wave. A fear sweeps over me. Is anybody going to shoot me? So <laughs> I don't remind me because my dad took me there one time when I was missions. Even before the plane touched down, like, you know, gunfire, you can see all explosives and you know, things. So I like, I'm just touching down, like, okay, anybody's going to shoot me though? I mean, at least I'm going back to. Airplane, you know, but it wasn't so. Safe landing. The memory is overwhelming, and I am a child shortly before the Khmer Rouge went to Civil War. Before they take my bar away, I am playing with other kids. All of us without shirts and shoes, there is worse going on. But we enjoy ourselves in spite of it. We swim gleefully in the warm Songkai River. That's one of the, the river that most of the kids go and bath, you know, girls and guys go bath at night. So that's, that's how we take a bath. And run in the fields and make up games of hockey in the mud and bamboo sticks. We stop when hear bombs and gunshots. When the fighting is nearby, we lie face down on the ground until explosion and gunfight fade. We always resume our games until the Camaros take over in 1975. All games stop. This memory is so strong for me, it's as if I have gone back in time. After a moment, I realize that 
that this is not a 70s. The war is over. The killing fields were just a memory. My pa is long gone, yet he is with me every step of this trip. My eyes begin to water, but I don't have time to cry. I have to, take, to make sure the president and his staff will be safe when they arrive. Duties always come first. It did for my pa, and it does for me. I make eye contact with Wright and knows that we have a job to do, and we will do it well. Failure, as we often say in the Secret Service, is not an option. We are here to protect the president. Thank you for, for this amazing presentation. I have a like, naive question. Did the President Obama know you from Cambodia and on the way to Cambodia? So, like, no. He uh, didn't? No, he, he didn't know. I mean, it's so many of us that he, he it's, it's not that his job to know. If he would know then, he probably would, you know, come and talk to me, but he doesn't have time for me anyway. He get other things to do. So I don't mind. I mean, I don't go there, hey, I'm Cambodia, I'm going to Cambodia. He talked to me, you know. But the other people use me, use my language to help them. So I help a lot of my guys, and, you know, on that trip, translation-wise. So it was busy for me. I don't get paid more, but yeah, I love to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you did. You went back with Michelle Obama in 2015. Yes. And then recently in the fall, you went with uh, President Biden. Yes. So you have been with uh, three uh, administration yeah. trips. Went back for the last time with uh, President Biden was the, the big uh, recognize ever back then. Because uh, I walked around. They put me in with uh, all these international guests and delegations coming in, language, whatnot. And Cambodians over there, you know, almost a half the size of me, we get more hair. So I walked around, <laughs> they looked at me, and then I started to speak Cambodian, and then the whole entire floor stopped. They looked at me and they said, you know, you spoke Cambodian well. I said, no, I was born here, I'm Cambodian. I said, no, you speak well. I said, no, I was born here, you know. <laughs> I had to explain to them, so. So everybody came and took a picture, and that was big recognition back right then. It was, you know, I was good. I mean, of course, I still have to use my language, and it takes me a little bit to, you know, get back to a normal conversation. So. How did, what was your route to working in the Secret Service? How did that come about? Well, um, the Secret Service was, if someone, we, we believe in 14 Tala in Cambodia, I don't know you guys know. If someone tell me, hey, you're gonna be a secret service 20 years ago, I say like, that's not me. Because thinking of becoming a secret service, you have to be born in the United States. So I am immigrant in this country, then speak English. I still learn how to speak English today. It's impossible, but I don't let anything, st what they say impossible, I'm gonna try it. So I try to work with the city, city of the state, state of the federal. Before I come to Secret Service, I work with the Department of Justice. So I said, well, I am in the federal government. And why can't I go with the next? While I was looking for the next level in the federal government, 9-11 happened. So I went to uh, the Army recruit in, Phil in Philadelphia. And there were lines long. I said, hey, you know, my name is, is I work for the Department of Justice. Here's my name, phone number, my social security. I want to volunteer to go to Afghanistan. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're good. Uh, they asked how old I am. I, I was 30, 32 years old then. So like, yeah, don't worry, we call you. You know, 24 years later, they haven't called me yet. <laughs> so um, my friend Joseph Gar used to work with me at the dealer cell aftercare, taking care of the kids, social worker. He called me, we were best friends. We, he called to me like, hey, everything's okay, you know, how bad is over there? Like that. I said, well, everything's locked down, you know, you know how the federal government, everything, the entire the whole country locked down 9-11. I said, well, I want to go to Afghanistan, volunteer, they haven't called me. He said, well, why are you come to Secret Service with me? I said, well, I'm not, a, you know, an American born here. I'm you know, like, no, you citizen, you're good. So I applied. Well, I have to take written test twice anyway. So. And then after that, and uh, 21, 22 years later, I went to six month training. I was the second or, second or third oldest in the class. So I make through the whole thing. Six months long training. Yeah. And yeah, that's, you were in Philadelphia at that time when you- I was you, in Philadelphia, you'd yes. You'd gone to Widener University yes. and, uh, and majored there. And then a couple of years later, you were at the yeah. Secret Service, so. Oh. Like I said, the Secret Service never ever imagined I would be a Secret Service. 
Not even. You're the first and the only or first uh, native Cambodian. Yeah, to work I in was. The Secret Service. I'm, I am the first native-born Cambodian joined the Secret Service since the Secret Service started, which 1865. So, roughly 150 years. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Naren. I'm with the Mayor's Commission on Asian American Affairs. Your story itself is such an inspiration for the immigrants and refugees here in the city of Philadelphia and across every city and across the nation. So can we just give them a round of applause, Paul? Okay. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm joined here by, with um, Peng. He's the president of the Vendors Association of, of FDR Park. Uh, we are, you know, he with the Southeast Asian market, FDR Park. The reason why we came here was wanted to make sure we show support for our Cambodian American brother. And also, you know, your story stuff, I remember growing up here in Philadelphia and um, in the early 90s, and you know how hard it was during those times. Your story was the one that really shined, like, we heard of you, but we didn't, we never, we never can met you. We, we found out that you was the first guy that went to Secret Service. And during this time, um, you know, in the 90s, in 2000, you know, Ameri uh, Philadelphia was hit hard for, with Cambodian Southeast Asian gangs, right? And, you know, at that time, there was, no, there was no one that's like you to inspire us to get involved, you know, to be in law enforcement, to get, to seek higher education. Considering coming here as refugees, being placed in the inner city, it was really hard. And I know you faced that growing up in South Philadelphia, the racial tension, the bullying, Throughout all that, what inspired you to, to like really, you know, grab yourself by the bootstrap and to be where you are right now? And also, what would you say to the immigrants and refugees now that's trying to make out there in the Secret Service? You're correct, because uh, this is uh, inspired me that what I want to be in the future, how far I can go. There's a lot of people in this world that don't like to see you go too far. It's a lot of jealousy, it's a lot of hatred in this world today. What I'm doing is like, what makes me a better person I listen to? What makes me the bad person I don't listen to? So my focus is, where can I go from here? Um, to, we all know, you know, Americans when you're 18, you know what's right, what's wrong. Certain thing you do, is it right in your heart? Or is it wrong? So I always say like, if it's wrong, why doing it? You know, to make a living, just a living, yes. Is that what you want to, to live like that all your life? You know, when I was in South Philly, and I always, you know, you're probably not gonna see me. That's probably one thing that get me away from me, all the troubles. I work a lot. I work a lot, you know, three, four hours, I mean, three, four jobs all the time, you know. Go to work, on a job, don't pay attention to nobody unless some person or something that makes me a better person, something benefits me that what I do. It sounds like I'm greedy, but I'm not. So there's people seeing you doing something good even till today. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, my job is bad. It, it just, everywhere you go, people's gonna look at you. Why, you know, especially growing up and making no money. Now I make somewhat good money anyway. I work a lot over times. And people are like, what are you doing that for? I said, I'm here, you know, they need me, they pay me, it's not I'm work for free. And if I don't work for free, I'm not gonna be, you know? So back to your question, like I do a lot of works, now I don't want one job which is work with survey, it's like two jobs anyway, sometimes seven days a week, 12 hours, 14 hours, sometimes 16, 20, I don't know, I lost count. Sometimes I go to work and say, what day is it? I don't know anymore. So that's why it gave me away from trouble. I was like, keep on focus what I'm gonna do. And like, example of a house or a car. You know, if, if I drive a, a, a Toyota Corolla or whatever, I wanna try Mercedes or Audi. What are you gonna do? You're not gonna go in and rob people. Yeah, it's a fast way to make money. That's one of probation and told the kids all the time. You work hard for it, it'll pay off. It's, it's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. It's like anything in this world. It's, there's a lot of difficulty you gotta face, but it's nothing impossible, you know. So, what I'm saying, like, you know, aim, you know, aim high, work hard, don't quit. You'll be there. You know there's certain people, by talking to them a while, 
you know that person is a good person or that person is just get you in the wrong path. You know? So, I, I, again, like I said, that probably keeps me from a lot of trouble because I work a lot of hours, a lot of jobs. In the morning, I'm out four, five, six, seven o'clock at night, I'm in, so in and out of the house. One way in, one way out, so. I just wanted to ask, I know that you had been, this was, the book was a concept for you for a number of years before you met Sam. Yes. But, uh, and it took you about six, seven years after you had met Sam to put this together. But, you know, this, this is your story. I was wondering what that editing process was like for you working with somebody else. And I've been edited by Sam before, so I know what that's like. <laughs> but uh, tell me a little bit about what that process was like to, once you had somebody to, to collaborate with, to pull the story together, because I'm sure parts of that were kind of like ripping Band-Aids off. It, it certainly is. And like I said, Sam did a good job. He put a lot of hours in it. And when I wrote it, it's a lot of things I missed in that book. So as we go on, you know, I said, what happened this? And the memory is coming back. It's like the one thing I'll forget about it is when I was uh, 12 or 13, um, when the Vietnamese liberator invaded, how you want to use it, I'm not going to touch that. So I walked back to look for my mom. And uh, the communist, communist, the Khmer Rouge, took me and kidnapped me. They accused me of spying on my friends. So at 13... They took me in, interrogated me for hours, you know, noose on my head, tied me to the chair, beat me down. I didn't die. So it's, it's a lot of painful memories. It's the only way to do that to motivate people, it to, to, to put out your pain, your suffering, or your, uh, what I should say, the thing that happened almost take your life to teach people education. Like, I almost died. I was long interrogation. I make it through. So what makes you think that you can't do that? You know, there's nothing in this country, in America, is a great country. There's nothing in this country that's impossible. It's difficult. Like me, I came and didn't speak English. It's difficult for me to go any job to you know be secret service. Not the tallest guy, not the most you know bodybuilder guy. But I make it through. Sometimes I get to take it twice. You know, so. Old saying, there's a will, there's a way. You know, nothing impossible. The difficult, the level of difficulty. Yeah, we ought to face that. Like I said earlier, you know, aim high. Don't quit, work hard, you know, keep moving. You, if you can't ride, walk, you can't walk, crawl, and just keep, by all means, just keep moving. You'll be there someday. And I'm, I'm glad he still talks to me because, you know, the editing process, you know, the, you know it's 110,000 words, and, you know, when you were walking through the jungle, was it, was it nine in the morning or was it eleven? Was it raining? Were you going north? You know, he, he's the, very uh, typical. And so I'm like, I, I tell like, I don't remember like forty some years ago. <laughs> but I had to say that though, he made it everything he put in book. He made like he was there with me the entire time. And of course, I had to read and make sure the memoirs. It's not just makeup. It's not science fiction. He made it like he was there with me. So. Yeah, it's painful. I remember he's all back. My dad, interrogation, kidnapping. It's, it's not easy. You know? That's a good thing I didn't bring any, they didn't bring any bones, so I'm just good. Hi, Bong. How are you? Hi. Um, I know that reading your book, I know you're older than me a couple of years. And I was there. And uh, I, I came from Baltimore. I, I was born there. Um, Reading your book is like, give me a lot of flashback during that time and going through that. It's just uh, traumatized. Um, I always remind myself that I forgive what happened, but I will never f forget what happened. And it shouldn't be that way. And your book really inspired, at least to me, is that coming from a background that traumatic and, and be able to come out that stigma and become the highest position you are hailing right now, I really said I have to admire you in terms of your mindset. 
But my question to you is that, as a secret agent, right? Officer, officer. Right, officer. Um, so you basically, at that, I mean, it can happen anytime. You really have to protect the president and the officer. Have, how do you cope in terms of like, uh, went through during the Khmer Rouge and also now that you put your life in line to protect, have you ever, how, how do you feel? I, I wanna know, how do, how do you feel that? How, how, how do you have a, a very strong mind and do your job the best you could? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I always believe in God in one way. Um, went through the killing fields, interrogates, starved to death, didn't die. So you have to make your own decision before you. Many people know what the Secret Service, you know, the movie, to take the bullet for president. That's half it ever happened. It happened during the Reagan administrations. So things get anything happened, they, they kind of technology become better and better. So to me, it's like if my time comes, it's my time come. And they tell you, you know, this is your job, what you're going to do. You can't back off from that. You don't have to. But, you know, I'm looking at my dad's, like I said earlier, he make almost nothing. He puts life on line. I don't know, um, military bag. They don't have all this equipment. It's like our army military half today. So there's no flat jacket. There's no helmet. Sometimes flip-flop to go and fight wars. You know, my dad didn't die. So I look at it, if my time comes, you know what, God wants me and it takes me. And you can't live in fear, you know, you can't live in fear. That's, and I am one of the guys, like, if it's a place like danger, I probably want to see what happened. And I don't believe people, like, sometimes people use that as scare tactic, you know. You go to Afghanistan, you know, here's one example. I think it was Bush in the Pakistan. So I would meet and write, Doing what they call a motorcade route. I'm the only dog. So my dog is, I'm not saying, that time I never say he's the greatest explosion detection, but now I say because it's not with me anymore. So you know how you jing yourself in a way. Almost eight miles, it's only him and I. So you do this motorcade route sweep. You look to the right, you see a bunch of Pakistan and look at you. Do you know who they are? I don't know. You know, you kind of watch what you're doing in a way. And uh, we as the Secret Service, we have a lot in tell. No, I shouldn't say that anyway. But we, we know what we get into anyway. And it's a thing that you have to sacrifice in a way. I mean, if time comes and you're gone. Back to, you know, all those memories. It's, it's, it is. It's hard. Like, every time Sam asks me the question about it, it's so painful to bring it back. But the only way to do, to do that to educate more people about it because people are not going to know what happened. Killing fields. People are oh, killing fields. They, they think, well, I walked to that, see a couple of bodies there. That's killing fields. It's not. Killing fields with the ashes a lot. There's, there's hundreds of bodies in one place. There's thousands in one place. There's a lot of killing fields. 1.7 mil million Cambodians die a day. So, you know, you have to bring it out. Use that as a way to teach or educate people. That's the only way. So. I just had a question for Sam. I know that your previous books were novels. So what drew you to working on a, a first-person memoir with Leth? And did you ever think about writing a third-person biography as opposed to a first-person to keep his voice in there? You know, I had never, I mean, I'd written three, no, published three novels before. There's actually written a couple others that are, one day I hope will be published. And I had never, you know, I think of myself as a novelist and wanted to write novels. Never planned to, you know, to be a ghostwriter or a co-author for somebody else's story. But I had done, you know, a ton of journalism and lots of stories. And I met Leth and, you know, knew he wanted to write his book. And I knew it should be a book. And I did think about doing it third person, but I... Yeah, the more I got to know him, and then I know that he wrote 50,000 words, I thought it belongs in his first-person voice. I mean, it's his story, and he wants to tell it. And I think it would be much more powerful to be a first-person thing that I could help him with as opposed to me writing it in a third person and trying to tell his story and, you know, trying to interpret his thoughts that way. So, um, you know, I think it, 
I don't want to do it again uh, for, you know, I want to write some more novels and not, you know, I don't think I'll ever meet anybody else like Leth. So I, uh, I'm glad that I did it and I'm proud of the book that we have and I, uh, you know, I think his, his life story deserved, uh, you know, the effort that I put into it and I'm thrilled with the way that, that it came out. But uh, I'm going to go back to fiction where you can make up things and <laughs> not, not get into trouble. Well, it's like I said, you know, like we live what 8,000 plus miles away from each other. So like, also, you know, everything happened for a reason. He, he, him and I met each other. He's like a brother to me, you know. We talk a lot of stuff to each other, so. Yeah, when he took <laughs> us on a tour of the White House, he introduced uh, me as his brother, and my wife as his uh, sister-in-law, and my daughter as his niece. So it was, uh, you know, we developed a really close relationship. You get some people look at like, yeah, like, yeah that's really my brother. <laughs> They're yeah. not, really, not really related. I didn't but, say what kind of brothers. I said his brother. I mean, you know. But, uh, I mean, too, like working on Lust's book has sort of transformed my view of the world a little bit to make me appreciate how, you know, good I've had it, you know, from, you know, with my parents and, the, you know, the, the life that I've led compared, you know, occasionally I would think about, oh, God, I'm having a hard time getting this book together. I'm tired. And I would think about whatever he had gone through. And, you know, I'm just being a baby. I got to keep, you know, get back to work. So uh, I've been very fortunate to, to get to know Leth. Leth, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Any last closing words? Uh, I just want to say thank you for being here. The time, your valuable time to listen to whole stories. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll meet again someday somehow. So. Appreciate a lot. Thank you. Thank you.